the life of King David. Today we embark on a journey into the remarkable life of a man who occupies a prominent place in the sacred pages of your Bible, King David, known as a man after God's own heart. David's life is a tapestry woven with threads of faith, obedience, and unwavering perseverance, and it holds invaluable lessons for us all. David's story begins in the humble town of Bethlehem, where he was born as the youngest of eight sons to Jesse. Despite his youth and lowly position, God had set him apart for a momentous destiny, to be the future king of Israel. But before David could ascend to this exalted role, he needed to undergo a period of testing and preparation, a journey that would shape his character and deepen his trust in God. In his formative years, David's daily task was to tend to sheep in the fields. This may seem mundane at first glance, but it was in these quiet moments that he imbibed crucial lessons about leadership and placing unwavering trust in the Almighty. In the solitude of the fields, he learned to protect his flock from wild animals and other dangers, relying solely on God's strength and divine guidance. While other children were engrossed in childhood games and pastimes, David faced lions and bears with courage and resolve. His youthful bravery was nothing short of astounding, as depicted in 1 Samuel 17, 34, 36. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. It is easy to gloss over the astonishing courage that young David displayed. The same courage that made him a great king was already evident in his early years. In a time when lions and bears freely roamed the Holy Land, facing them was no small feat, yet David was a warrior from birth. He was a man of action, a radical individual who embraced life's challenges head on. Even as king, David remained a warrior, leading from the front lines and displaying unwavering courage. He was not like the kings of this day and age. David was on the front line with his men. David was a king that would be in the trenches with his men. He and his men once defeated 200 Philistines, presenting their foreskins as a testimony of their triumph. Songs were composed and sung about David and the countless enemies he destroyed. The women would joyfully sing, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. David was not your average king, he was a militant and fearless leader. David's life was a testament to his warrior spirit, one that ran through his veins from a young age. He was the man who pursued lions and bears, who faced giants, battled armies, and displayed unmatched valor. David understood that it was the Lord who had trained his hands for war and his fingers for battle. The story of King David's life unfolds against the backdrop of the reign of King Saul, the first king of Israel. Saul's disobedience led to God's rejection of him as king, and the prophet Samuel was tasked with anointing a new God-chosen leader. Led by divine guidance, Samuel arrived at the house of Jesse in Bethlehem, where he was to anoint the chosen one from among Jesse's sons. Upon seeing Jesse's sons, Samuel was initially inclined to select the one who appeared most kingly in stature. However, the Lord intervened, reminding Samuel that he looks beyond outward appearances, declaring, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. From this moment we begin to grasp the uniqueness of David's calling, Though he was the youngest and perhaps least physically imposing among Jesse's sons, God's choice rested firmly on his heart. In that defining moment, Samuel anointed David in the presence of his brothers, an act that would usher in a transformative journey for the young shepherd. David's anointing is a powerful reminder that God sees the depths of our hearts, not our external attributes or societal status. He chooses us based on the character within, not the facade we present to the world. David's life story echoes the timeless truth that God's ways are not our ways, and he selects individuals for his purposes based on their heart's alignment with his will. 
David's life was marked by both courage on the battlefield and an open expression of deep emotion. He famously defeated the giant Goliath, securing victory in numerous battles, earning him the reputation of a mighty man of valor. Yet beneath the warrior's exterior beat the heart of a man who felt deeply. David was unafraid to openly express his emotions, shedding tears and mourning without reservation. He poured out his heart to God through the Psalms, offering a raw and honest glimpse into the spectrum of human emotions, joy, sorrow, and everything in between. What is interesting about King David is that this man, this great man of God, had a problem with sin, much like you and I. There are those who try to create an impression that they do not have sin, but the Bible clearly states otherwise. First, John 1, 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. David, a great man, warrior, and inspirational figure known as a man after God's own heart, authored many psalms but struggled with sin. When asked about David's greatest sin, most people refer to his affair with Bathsheba. This incident highlights that David had a problem with women, revealing a significant moral flaw. David had issues with women, and his encounter with Bathsheba highlighted the extent of this problem. This particular sin is often pointed out and emphasized as David's greatest transgression. Let's delve into this sin for a deeper understanding of it. Whilst walking on the roof of his palace, King David saw Bathsheba bathing. Captivated by her beauty, David inquired about her and learned she was Uriah the Hittite's wife. Despite this, he summoned her to his palace, leading to an affair. Bathsheba later informed David of her pregnancy. To conceal their affair, David tried to make Uriah believe the child was his by summoning him from the battlefield, but Uriah refused to visit his wife, citing loyalty to his fellow soldiers. David then sent Uriah back with orders that ultimately led to his death. Following Uriah's death and Bathsheba's mourning period, David married her. This chain of actions, including adultery, deceit, and murder, led to tragic consequences, including the deaths of four individuals as part of the fallout from David's sins. Imagine this one sin resulted in the death of four individuals. This was indeed a great sin. But to the surprise of many, David committed a sin that led to the death of 70,000 people, which was not a sin of the flesh, but a sin of the spirit. As Christians, we often focus primarily on overt, obvious sins of the flesh, such as adultery, fornication, and drunkenness. However, we rarely focus on sins of the spirit like the one David committed. The repercussions of this sin were severe, resulting in a high number of casualties. This highlights the importance of recognizing and addressing all types of sin, not just the most visible or physical ones. 1 Chronicles 21.1 and Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. David ordered a census of Israel and Judah, despite the reluctance of Joab, his commander, who sensed it was a bad idea. Interestingly, even with Joab's questionable reputation and his history of bad deeds, he showed more sense than David in this situation. Nevertheless, David insisted, and the census was completed, with the numbers reported back to him. The sin in this act was David's pride and reliance on military strength instead of trusting in God's provision and protection. Counting the people, likely for military conscription or taxation, was indeed a lack of faith in God and show of pride from King David. And God was displeased with this thing, therefore he smote Israel. And David said unto God, I have sinned greatly, because I have done this thing, but now I beseech thee, do away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. And the Lord spake unto Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and tell David, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things. Choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. So Gad came to David, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Choose thee either three years famine, or three months to be destroyed before thy foes, while that the sword of thine enemies overtaketh thee, or else three days the sword of the Lord, even the pestilence in the land, and the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the coasts of Israel. 
Now therefore advise thyself what word I shall bring again to him that sent me. And David said unto Gad, I am in a great strait. Let me fall now into the hand of the Lord, for very great are his mercies, but let me not fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent pestilence upon Israel, and there fell of Israel seventy thousand men, and God sent an angel unto Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he was destroying, the Lord beheld, and he repented him of the evil, and said to the angel that destroyed, It is enough, stay now thine hand. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And David lifted up his eyes, and saw the angel of the Lord stand between the earth and the heaven, having a drawn sword in his hand stretched out over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders of Israel, who were clothed in sackcloth, fell upon their faces. And David said unto God, Is it not I that commanded the people to be numbered? Even I it is that have sinned and done evil indeed. But as for these sheep, what have they done? Let thine hand, I pray thee, O Lord my God, be on me and on my father's house, but not on thy people, that they should be plagued. Then the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David, that David should go up and set up an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And David went up at the saying of Gad, which he spake in the name of the Lord. And Ornan turned back and saw the angel, and his four sons with him hid themselves. Now Ornan was threshing wheat. And as David came to Ornan, Ornan looked and saw David, and went out of the threshing floor, and bowed himself to David with his face to the ground. Then David said to Ornan, Grant me the place of this threshing floor, that I may build an altar therein unto the Lord. Thou shalt grant it me for the full price, that the plague may be stayed from the people. And Ornan said unto David, Take it to thee, and let my lord the king do that which is good in his eyes. Lo, I give thee the oxen also for burnt offerings, and the threshing instruments for wood, and the wheat for the meat offering. I give it all. And King David said to Ornan, Nay, but I will verily buy it for the full price, for I will not take that which is thine for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings without cost. So David gave to Ornan for the place six hundred shekels of gold by weight. God expressed his displeasure with the census and presented David with a choice of three punishments, three years of famine, three months of defeat by enemies, or three days of plague. David chose the plague, leading to the death of 70,000 men. In the midst of this tragedy, David saw the angel of the Lord with a drawn sword over Jerusalem. He then bought the threshing floor where he had seen the angel and offered sacrifices there. David acknowledged his sin and built an altar as God had instructed and offered sacrifices. In response to David's repentance, God commanded the angel to stop the plague, halting the disaster at the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. Imagine the gravity of committing a sin that results in the deaths of so many people. Yet even in the face of such a grave mistake, God forgave David, this story underscores the severity of sin, its consequences, and the profound nature of God's forgiveness. As we reflect on the life of King David, a man deeply revered yet profoundly flawed, we find ourselves confronting the universal struggle with sin, a struggle that resonates with each of us. The journey of David, from his humble beginnings as a shepherd boy to his ascent as the revered King of Israel, is a story marked not only by divine favor, but also by human failing. David's life, as we've seen, is a testament to both the heights of godly obedience and the depths of moral failure. His sins, notably the affair with Bathsheba and the devastating census that led to a plague, serve as stark reminders of the gravity of sin and its far-reaching consequences. Yet within this life of failure and fall, there lies a profound message of hope and redemption a message that speaks directly to the hearts of those burdened by their own transgressions. To those sitting with heavy hearts, burdened by hidden or known sins, know that your story doesn't end in despair. If you carry secret sins, evil deeds that haunt you, 
be assured there is a God in heaven who longs to forgive you. For those who feel they have emerged from lives of total evil, sin, and darkness, understand this. God has forgiven people with darker pasts than yours. Satan has the power to make you feel like the worst sinner known to man. But remember, you are not the first to commit that sin, nor will you be the last. Satan can also make you feel too unworthy to pray or ask for God's forgiveness. Yet even on your best days, your righteousness is like filthy rags before the Lord. The narrative of King David's life is not just a tale of victory and downfalls, but more importantly, it is a story of grace, forgiveness, and restoration. The same God who forgave David despite the enormity of his sins looks upon you with eyes of mercy and arms wide open. In the depths of David's failure, when the weight of his sins seemed insurmountable, he turned to God with a contrite heart. It was in his acknowledgement of his transgressions and his earnest plea for forgiveness that we witness the boundless mercy of God. This is the crux of our message today. No sin is too great, no past too dark, for the redemptive power of God's love. If you find yourself struggling with guilt, shackled by the chains of past mistakes, remember that you are not beyond the reach of God's grace. The same God who restored David, who turned his mourning into dancing and clothed him with joy, is ready to do the same for you. You are not destined for eternal despair. You are a child of a forgiving God, a God who delights in turning ashes into beauty. Take heart in the truth that God's love is not conditional on our perfection. His forgiveness is not a prize awarded to the faultless, but a gift freely given to those who seek it. Like David, you too can find solace in the loving embrace of the Father, a refuge where your sins are washed away and your soul is renewed. No sinner is too dark. Whether it is murder, lying, deception, uncleanness, pride, envy, greed, wrath, sloth, gluttony, covetousness, fornication, adultery, sexual immorality, gossiping, fraud, backbiting, or any sin you have ever committed, God can forgive you. An interesting aspect of King David's story is that the site of the threshing floor he purchased eventually became the location of the temple. Isn't that remarkable? David committed two significant sins. His affair with Bathsheba, which eventually led to the birth of wise King Solomon, and the sin of numbering the people. As a result of the sin of numbering, he acquired the territory for building the temple which Solomon would later construct. Two things, repercussions of sin coming together, resulting in the first temple in Jerusalem. Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. King Solomon built the first temple in Jerusalem. This temple, also known as Solomon's Temple, was the first holy temple of the ancient Israelites. Only the God we serve can bring such a wonderful thing from sin. Only God can turn sinner into saint. Only God can turn a mess into miracle. Only the God we serve can forgive of your sins. Right now, wherever you are, ask forgiveness, and watch how God transforms your life forever. Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. As we close this chapter on David's life, let us carry with us the enduring truth of God's unchanging character, a God of second chances, a healer of broken spirits, a God who leaves the 99 to go find the one, a redeemer of lost souls. In him you will find forgiveness, in him you will find peace, and in him you will find the strength to rise again even when you have fallen. Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. Hate sin and love God. Hate sin and love God. Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. Psalms 91 and 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. In the shadows of the Almighty, there are some things that cannot happen to a child of God. And I'm going to list some of these cannots. Cannot number one, you cannot curse what God has blessed. Cannot number two, you cannot separate me or you from the love of God. And cannot number three, you cannot snatch my salvation or your salvation. Let's look at cannots number one. You cannot curse what God has blessed. You will be hard pressed to hear a sermon on curses in modern day Christianity. But the Bible reveals to us that curses are real. 
And if you look in our modern society, there is a rise in modern day witchcraft and occult practices. There are so many TV shows and movies and franchises centered around witchcraft that it's practically a part of our society. People no longer think curses are real. We have become desensitized to witchcraft, curses, and spells in today's culture. The Bible speaks of curses, and that Bible assures us that we as children of God are protected. You don't know what stuff people are into. I can say this with certainty. I am sure over the course of your life, multiple people have attempted to curse you in one form or another. Don't be naive to think everyone likes you or loves you. There are people who will smile at you to your face, but inwardly hate you. Don't be naive. Proverbs 26 and 2. Like a flitting sparrow, like a flying swallow, so a curse without cause shall not alight. This means that curses made against innocent people have no effect. You cannot curse what God has blessed. The simple fact that you are born again means that you are blessed beyond measure. Every demon in hell cannot touch you. Satan himself cannot touch you. No spiritual force can interfere in your life unless God allows it. Do you remember in the book of Job, Satan knew exactly who Job was. He knew everything about Job and he knew about his house, his family, his belongings. Satan had watched Job, but he couldn't do anything to Job. Why? Job 1 and 10. Has not thou made an hedge about him, and about his house, and about all that he has on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. God had put a hedge of protection around him. God is not a respecter of persons if he was protecting Job. He is protecting you. There is a real tangible hedge of protection around your life. There is a real tangible hedge of protection around your loved ones. This does not mean nothing negative will ever happen to you. No, we live in an imperfect fallen world. And for this reason, negative stuff will happen to everyone because that is the nature of this world. For instance, losing a loved one is a negative experience in someone's life, but it doesn't mean a hedge of protection isn't around. That is the nature of the world. It is a fallen world and negative things happen in a fallen world. But within this fallen world, you have a God who is actively watching over you. He is actively protecting you. He doesn't sleep nor slumber, but he is an active interest in your life. The only unfortunate thing about God's protection, and I use the word unfortunate to grab your attention, because in all honesty, it's not even unfortunate. But the only unfortunate thing about God's protection is that God does such a good job of protecting us, we don't see what could have happened. If it had not been for the Lord, some of us right now would be dead and in the pits of hell. If it had not been for the Lord, there are countless situations that would have defeated us. If God's hedge of protection was not around you, Satan would have had a field day within your life within 24 hours, just like he did with Job. In the space of 24 hours, he lost all his children, all his health, all of his wealth. You and I need to thank God for all things that we are not aware of that he has protected us from. Isaiah 54 and 17, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. There's a protection in abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. God is protecting you, and not only you, he is protecting your family. Notice 
that Job's children were under this protection because of their father's actions. We don't serve a God who doesn't care about what we care about. God cares about your children. He loves them. When they are out in this world, he protects them. When they are in school, he is watching over them. This is a biblical principle. People around you are being blessed and protected because of you. We don't only see this in the life of Job. We see this in the life of Laban. Look at what Laban said to Jacob. Genesis 30 and 27. And Laban said to him, please stay. If I have found favor in your eyes, for I have learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me for your sake. In other words, he said, I have learned that God has blessed me because of you. An unbelieving husband may not know that all the wonderful things that are happening in his life and his home is because he has a believing wife that loves the Lord. Your children could be flourishing because of you. God cares about your loved ones. You cannot curse what God has blessed. And if you are a child of God, you are blessed beyond measure. Cannot number two. You cannot separate me or you from the love of God. Romans 8, 38 and 39, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul doesn't want his readers to feel an ounce of insecurity about God's love for them in Christ. Stop feeling insecure in your relationship with God. Does God really love me? Does he really? Paul highlighted to us that we should not feel insecure at all about our relationship with the Lord. This is the point that we all need to arrive to, to know that I am loved by God. I am persuaded that God loves me. This is where you need to arrive. I am convinced that God loves me. This is where you need to arrive. I am certain that God loves me. This is where you need to arrive. If every angel that there is, and we know that they are innumerable, if every single one of them were to come together, and to point the finger at God and give God the ultimatum to stop loving you, God will choose you. God is in your corner. God wants the very best for you. God is not angry at you. God is not against you. God is for you. Stop thinking that God is against you. If God was truly against you, brother, you would know it. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, death will not separate me from his love, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, absolutely nothing, whether natural on this earth or supernatural from heaven or hell could ever cause God to stop loving us nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing. Cannot number three. Because I am dwelling in the secret place, you cannot snatch my salvation. John 10, 27 through 28. My sheep hear my voice and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Thank God. Thank God my salvation is not in the hands of anyone else but his hands. My life is in his hands. My salvation is in his hands. My hopes are in his hands. My dreams are in his hands. No one, not a single person can snatch me out of his hands. 
The shadow of God is a place of perfect protection. Life has its storms. Life has its struggles. Life has its painful experiences. But we can find perfect peace in the shadow of God. No evil can overwhelm you when you abide under the shadow of the Lord, although challenges may come. You will always come out of them victorious. The promise of God in Isaiah 43 and 2 is for those who dwell under his shadow. The promise reads, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Just as the people of Israel faced physical and spiritual enemies, we too face enemies in our daily lives. Isaiah 54, 17 No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. What does Isaiah 54, 17 really mean? It means the Lord will not allow the weapons formed against His children to prosper. In other words, the objective of that weapon being formed against you will not come to fruition. It will not succeed in its mission. Notice how the Word of God mentioned the fact that weapons will be formed. In other words, you may go through some tests and some battles, but those battles will not destroy or accomplish the plan of the devil in your life. God has not fallen asleep on the job. God never sleeps and He never slumbers. He is watching over. Sometimes, this means the Lord takes the weapon out of the hand of the enemy of His children. Sometimes, it means that God allows the weapon to strike, but brings a greater good out of it than the pain of the immediate blow. Isn't that amazing that we serve a God who is able to turn bad situations into the best things that have ever happened to you? Isn't it amazing that God is a God who can turn bad situations good and good situations better? Genesis 50, 20 But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring it about as it is this day, to save many people alive. Look at that phraseology. God did not say no weapons will be formed, full stop. No, God said the weapons will be formed, arrows will be thrown. But what God assured you and me is that they will not prosper. They will not accomplish the purpose it has been sent to do. So don't be afraid. The Lord is telling you today that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. What are you afraid of? No weapon formed against you shall prosper. What are you scared of? No weapon formed against you shall prosper. What are you worried about? Romans 8:31. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Answer this question today. If God be for us, who or what can be against us? Answer this question today. If God be for you, who or what can be against you? Can sickness be against you? No. Can persecution be against you? No. Can calamity be against you? No. Can death be against you? No. Can heartache or trauma or suffering be against you? No, no, no. Romans 8.31 is a reminder that no matter what challenges we may face in this life, we have a God who is on our side. When we face difficulties, we may feel like we are alone and that the world is against us. But this verse reminds us that with God on our side, we are never truly alone. God is a powerful ally who can provide us with the strength and courage we need to face any obstacle that comes our way. And while others may be against us, if God is for us, what does it matter? With God, you are the majority and not the minority. 
As Christians, we will undoubtedly face suffering and trials in this life. We may experience persecution, discrimination, and even oppression because of our faith. But we can take comfort in knowing that we serve a God who is greater than any of these challenges. In fact, the Apostle Paul himself faced immense suffering during his ministry. He was beaten, imprisoned, and stoned for preaching the gospel. Yet, he never lost faith in God. In fact, in his letter to the Romans, he writes that he is convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8, 38 and 39 We too can have this same confidence. We can trust in the love and faithfulness of our God, knowing that nothing can separate us from Him.